welcome everyone to this third uh, webinar before we begin the important event of the Synod. And I would like to welcome those of you who are online, following in, in a multitude of languages, and also Sister Natalie Bacar from the Synod office is with us, members of the UISG board, and members of the USG board who are also delegates at the Synod. And in the room also, we have others who are participating in various roles uh, during the Synod. So welcome to all. Um, and as we begin our proceedings, uh, I want to introduce Sister Mary Barron, who's sitting beside me. Uh, Sister Mary is the new president of UISG. Um, she's also Irish. Uh, she serves as congregational leader. So it must be an Irish takeover. <laughs> uh, she serves as the congregational leader of the Sisters of Our Lady of the Apostles, which is a missionary congregation founded in France in 1876. And she has dedicated her life to evangelization, particularly in Africa. Sister gained missionary experience in Nigeria and Tanzania, and she engaged in youth, women, and HIV AIDS projects. With 15 experience in Mary about intercongregational listeners. She has served as joint coordinator of a mission and a project in Ireland and held positions in the state of Sedos. is a service and study on book. Sedos is based in and is our congregations or congregation missions. She currently serves as president of SEDOS and now other responsibility, the president. She was elected to the executive board of UISG in 2019 and has become its president in September 2023. So Sister Mary will offer some words of welcome. Thank you, Pat, for the introduction, and welcome to one and all, those here in the room and those online. My words will be very brief, so that we have more time for interaction and sharing. But just to say that the third in the series of preparatory webinars to help us to prepare to further and deepen our engagement in the synodal journey with the entire church community and beyond. And the focus of today is on participation, which is the third of the three major areas of consideration from the Instrumentum Laboris, the work document for the Synod, and indeed from what has been the Synod logo from the outset. Later, we will hear a short reflection from the five UISG delegates to the Senate and three of the USG delegates. So I do not want to preempt anything that will be shared. But by way of introduction to this session, I would rather like to make an appeal to all of us, all of us gathered here and gathered online in relation to two things. First, to reflect on participation within our own congregations. And secondly, to encourage us all to continue to participate in this synodal journey through actively praying for the fruitfulness of this synod. So to briefly address the first point, undoubtedly, this call to synodality is for the entire church to awaken us to a more authentic expression 
of what was envisioned by Christ as he commissioned his followers to go out and live the message of love, forgiveness, communion, God's dream for the world. As consecrated life, it is repeatedly suggested that we have a lot to offer on this synodal journey because being synodal is in our DNA. Listening to each other, discerning together, taking spirit-guided decisions together, journeying together in living out these decisions, all of this is constitutive of how we function in religious life. But I would like to sound a note of caution. It is true in the main that our structures do lend themselves to synodal experiences. But we are human and perhaps we can take these structures for granted. We can be complacent believing that having chapters or assemblies or community meetings, that this is enough, that this means that we are being synodal or living synodality. Perhaps we need to have an honest assessment of where we are in terms of synodality. How synodal are our present structures, the structures we work with in our respective congregations? Are they in need of an injection of something new, new energy, new perspectives, new voices? We need to evaluate our structures to objectively discern if they are truly synodal, truly participative, or are so only in name. A key point that emerges from many of the continental documents for the Synod is the absence of certain voices in the discussion. They are not even at the table, they are not even near the table. How do we ensure the peripheral voices, even within our own congregations, are invited to and encouraged to participate? What efforts do we make to proactively create spaces of genuine listening, sharing, of cultivating the necessary conditions for us to sense the movement of the spirit. So that is the first appeal I would make, that we evaluate how synodal we really are in our life and continue that journey to improve as we can. And as I said, my second appeal, is simply to encourage ourselves, our membership, as wide a community as possible to support this synod through prayer. I think it's very important that we, we are supported as we open ourselves to the spirit, to be guided by that spirit. There are ways that facilit facilitate the participation of all who wish to do so in some of the significant prayer moments of the synod. For example, the ecumenical prayer vigil tomorrow evening will be broadcast live, so everyone can follow. As I think will be the retreat inputs over the next three days. There are certain prayer days where anyone who desires can follow that prayer. So I would encourage all our members to really tune in and be part of this synodal journey. So, on that note and that appeal, I wish us all a very enjoyable synodal encounter this afternoon. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sister Pat and also Sister Mary. It's a delight to be together again for our third of three sessions. Uh, being here in Rome, I must admit the excitement is building for the Synod. Uh, definitely for tomorrow evening's gathering of prayer and celebration uh, with the Taizé community and 50 other uh, groups that have worked together to have 
the prayer gathering. And you're, as Sister Mary said, most welcome to join us wherever you are in person or also online. And we are blessed to this year. I, we have begun each of our sessions with the Adsumo Sante Spirit Prayer. And in well, today, uh, and it's the prayer that was used at the beginning of every session of Vatican II. And we continue to hear that this synod is a conception of Vatican II, uh, including looking at the church as the people of God and what does that mean and call us to. So today, we have a new musical arrangement of this prayer. The words are the same. But the Taizé community was invited, asked to please write the Ad Summa Sancti Spiritus with the exact words, uh, but please bring it into different languages and in the mode of Taizé. And so they are working, I think there'll be even more languages of this, but I want you uh, to just uh, invite you to pray with us. This will be part of the opening prayer on tomorrow uh, as we begin the prayer, Taize prayer ecumenical prayer service. So it's an opportunity for us to hear it. Uh, I'll also say, listen to it because the first the first intonations you will recognize as Veni Sancti Spiritus, and then it moves. So uh, this is a beautiful gift the Taizé community also offers us uh, as we prepare. So I'm inviting our uh, communication team to give it to you with the original.
It's a beautiful prayer. It's also available online, so you can, with us, pray this every day. And it will be used during the Synod as well, the session. So you're praying with us in this powerful moment. This afternoon here, what we would like to do is just offer a few more synodal notes uh, and then open up the third area of participation. And from there, invite each of our eight panelists to share a few minutes uh, so that you get their voice, but also uh, so some of their wisdom can come forth before you go into the small groups and, and share what's moving in you. So first is participation in the Synod. I, informed participation is required for the Synod because each person will have time and will be asked to address the body. And particularly in the small groups, in the spirit, every person must speak and offer her wisdom and then listen to the And then a so it's really a moment where they're and only listening, but it's a deep amount and then contributing what the spirit's inviting you to hear and share. So it's it's a and the hope is for the planners and Pope Francis that this is not simply something that happens at the but that with one another in our places in the church. Second, the UISG, USC Synod contribution. The delegates that are offering us the wisdom today will bring to it their expertise, their experience, their living of religious life, of consecrated life. And one particular resource we have offer, among others, is the UISB, USB country. When the around the world, in different locations, uh, all over, I, sisters and brothers and religious priests were invited to participate in those. But UISB and USB was also asked very specifically, we want to hear from the religious what do you have as your experience of church? And what do you sense the Spirit is calling to us as consecrated men and women and also as members of the church? The document came forth, it was offered, and, and I can say a number of the people who were writing one of the synod documents said this was really helpful to us. If you take some time it. And as we work on our synodal commitment, we will be engaging this further. I think you will find that what we're hearing around the world is all here. It simply says, 
God. So it's in many languages on the YS website, also on CNN, which has an incredible number. So, so it's, it's one of the elements, one of the resources that religious life is already engaged in. Continue. And the third piece that we are is with our speakers, with our panelists today. They were invited, as were you, to look, and here I'm going to use our slide, uh, to look at the questions on participation, which looks at governance and authority. So if we can have Uh, it's one back, one back, ah. means I have to go one back. There you go. Uh, so these were three of the questions, and there were five, because they were that as well. If you look at these first three or four, the third key area that we discussed in terms of priority, in addition for our question, who is the church? What does it mean to be church? And what is the spirit of us in this kingdom? Is to look at participation, governance, and authority. And to ask what processes and institutions are needed in a missionary church, synodal church? How could we, we renew the service of authority and the exercise of responsibility? in a missionary synodal church? How can we develop discernment practices and decision-making processes in an authentically synodal manner, one that respects the protagonism of the spirit? And what structures can be developed to strengthen a missionary synodal church? So your panelists were invited to look at that, and in there, to also ask, what are your experiences in reality, in religious life, and in the church? What does religious life offer to any of these questions on the synodal journey? And even, is there an image that for you speaks to this? So they were a lot of and I those also. So as you are listening, you're invited to emerging for you, and, and what calls you, and maybe what is your contribution? These are areas particularly that religious have quite a bit of experience in. All of you in religious life uh, understand the sense of communal discernment. So I hope we'll hear some of this from our delegates. And so we will proceed with just a brief introduction of, of the delegates one by one. And they will offer about three minutes of their reflections. And we'll have a little bit of silence and then to the next. After four people, we'll take a longer bit of silence to let this move in you. And then we'll have numbers five, six, seven, and eight share with us. Uh, from there, we'll go into some conversation in spirit. Right? Sister Patricia Murray will be our first panelist. Uh, she is known to many of you, but in case some of you are coming to this anew, she is the Executive Secretary of the International Union of Superiors General. And she is a member of the IBD Sisters, or also known as, the, known as the Loretto Sisters from Ireland. She taught at public schools, she worked as a peace education officer and as president of the Irish Episcopal Commission for Justice and Peace. She was a principal in an inner city school in Dublin, and while doing so, she was a vice president for the National Council for Curriculum and Assessment, a government appointment. She was the first director of the Loretto's Schools Network in Ireland and was a member of the General Council in her congregation from 1996, 1998 to 2006. So in many, over the many years, she has worked often with others to initiate creative intercongregational 
pastoral resources to respond to the needs of today. And so they include establishing intercongregational communities in South Sudan and Sicily, Lampedusa in developing networks against human trafficking and connecting sisters working with migrants and refugees. She was the first executive director of Solidarity with South Sudan. She comes to us with much wisdom, experience, and we're grateful to have her offer her words of wisdom. Thank you, Sister Pat. Thank you, Maria. Thank you very much. I skipped the kind of questions and went to, I think, the fifth one that asked, what contribution have religious to contribute to the Synod? And I have three points I want to make in the three minutes I have. The first is that for many years, many religious congregations, particularly of women, I think, have been using the method of spiritual what is now better named conversation in the spirit, undertaking discernment about important matters. In my own congregation, it was introduced in 1986 at a general chapter. And that freed us because we moved from discussion and debate to a process of listening, making space for each voice, listening to the call of the spirit. Another very important conversation in the spirit took place for me, which affected me deeply, was during the solidarity visit to South Sudan. We were in the name of the two unions, UISG and USG. There were three women religious, three male religious. And we spent hours each day listening for over a month in five dioceses to the pain and suffering of the people of South Sudan, who often said to us, thank you for coming to listen to us. We thought the world had forgotten about us. We thought the church had forgotten about us. So I learned the significance of listening. Each night as a group and with the representative of the South Sudan Bishop Conference, we reflected on what we heard during the day against the scripture of the day, asking God, what are you asking of us as religious and of the church today in answer to the needs of South Sudan? The outcome was what we know today is the Solidarity with South Sudan initiative, which in religion lay with the clergy and the diocese in South Sudan in an innovative initiative, a new way of participating and of listening deeply. My second point is on mutuality, which flows from the first. Now many conferences of religious throughout the world are conferences of both men and women religious. Increasingly at these conferences, the voices of women are contributing to theological reflection on the church, on religious life, and on pastoral needs. In addition, men and women from different charismatic families are working together on issues related to trafficking, environment, migrant refugees, peace, advocating for justice, and on the association of the day. So as men and women with leadership and with members of the church, we have an experience of living and mastering in multicultural settings, learning how to listen to one another's voice, one another's cultural experience, and learning and trying to become intercultural where we change one another. And finally, my third point, when thinking of female religious life today, I want to focus on vulnerability, which was the theme of our assembly, embracing vulnerability on the journey. Because there is an increased experience of 
vulnerability in religious congregations of women, of sisters. And that's leading to a deeper change, both spiritually and organizationally. Diminished numbers, past failures, diminishing resources, often little or no preparation for service rendered, leading to an uncertain future, has led us to a great place of humility and a reliance on the Holy Spirit, but a reliance on others knowing that we cannot move forward alone, as might have been done in the past. We're discerning what God is asking of us to be effective in mission and ministry. We've reconfigured our congregations in order to be more effective in mission and ministry. And another aspect of this vulnerability is trying to explain consecrated life today with all its diversity to a world that and that we believe that there's much more than us, but that calling it to be attentive to the signs of the times and to be a prophetic listening presence at the new frontiers, which we know to be both geographic and existential. But we have learned we can't respond alone, and it's only together as all the people of God that we can meet the complex challenges of today. Thank you very much. And just a moment of silence before Sister Mary offers her reflection. Sister Patricia, we'll have her speak now. Thank you, Maria. <laughs> um, I too was a little bit creative with the questions. So my reflection is more from my own personal experience. What have I learned throughout my time in religious life that will help me move into this synod? and what wisdom I feel I can offer in that space. So I have been lucky enough, I would say, to live and work in, as a missionary in what could have been described as one of the peripheries of our church back 28 years ago when I was missioned to a rural diocese in Tanzania. And I would say in this place, I learned so much about participation and journeying synodally with people. A powerful experience of synodality for me, which I note that the African continental document mentions, was the experience of sharing in the basic Christian communities. The village church community divided into several small groups. We had weekly gatherings sharing on the gospel deciding together how to put that gospel into action. It was a shared time of prayer and listening, a shared decision around a common action. We didn't call it synodality, but it was very much synodality in action. And then fast forward 28 years to this year, when we held our 18th general chapter as a congregation. And I would say the entire process of preparing for and living out this chapter was for us a deeply synodal experience. The preparations involved circles of conversation, allowing the issues to emerge, taking the time to encourage the participation of all and providing the possibility for that participation. So for example, in our congregation, sometimes it can be difficult for younger members 
to express themselves freely in front of older members because of our congregational norms or perhaps cultural norms. And so for the first time, we created circles of conversation in age groups, removing this barrier and freeing people for very profound and authentic conversations. During the chapter itself, a great emphasis was placed on forming discerning communities. The body was divided into eight communities. We didn't call them work groups like we usually would. We call them discerning communities. And that point alone, changing the name and the focus of the small group had an impact. Building up the relationships in these communities and creating the conditions for sharing were equally as important as noting and carrying forward the issues that were emerging. So genuine encounter, building relationships, creating conditions where we can sense the movement of the spirit. And so for me, from both of these experiences, a key learning is that it is not enough to assume that people will participate if they're given the opportunity. People need to be equipped and confident to participate and to feel that they will actually be listened to. So sensitivity to the inclusiveness or otherwise of our methodology is very important, as is taking the necessary steps to equip people for participation, building relationships of trust that facilitate authentic sharing is key. So in brief, that is the perspective and the experience in relation to participation that I'm carrying with me into the Synod. And I'm hoping that we will create these communities of authentic sharing where we can be open to the spirit. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Mary. And we take a moment of silence to see what resonates with us. Our third panelist is Brother Ernesto Sanchez Barba, Mexican and Superior General of the Institute of the Marist Brothers since 2017. He is six years into his term of eight years. It is a congregation with educators, brothers, laymen and women, and they are present in 78 countries. In 2018, he was one of 10 participants of the USG in the Synod on Young People, Faith, and Vocational Discernment. From 2018 to 2021, he was part of the Union of Superiors General Board of Directors and the Council of 16 in the Dicastery for Consecrated Life. Bienvenidos, mi hermano. Muchas gracias. Thank you so much. Thank you. A good afternoon to you. I will talk in Mexican Spanish. Thank you. Thank you for your kind invitation. Thank you for this meeting. Thank you for our sharing among religious women and men throughout the world. I believe that our connection is crucial. We are th threads woven together, and this is crucial. We this is a true uh, witness of synodality in the framework of our church. I believe that our presence as religious men and women in the synod is a lovely opportunity that we have. We have to share our experience of dialogue and common discernment in our congregations. I would posit that this is crucial. 14 years ago in our congregation, we had uh, 
a general chapter with uh, round tables, listening to the spirit, looking for consensus. It was crucial for us to hear for, from every person. Many people couldn't talk anyway, because at the beginning it wasn't easy. But step by step, we saw a big change in the following chapter and assemblies. We dwell on the importance of dialogue among lay people, religious people, and youth. And about the youth, I recall that in the Synod of 2018, we had 40 young people that participated that were well welcomed in the um event every young person had the same opportunity to talk the same opportunity that we had as delegates of the Senate and one of the biggest round days of a process was actually for one of the young people who decided to speak as for participation and authority, I believe that this is crucial. This is a continuous in invitation to be in touch with the leadership of our Lord. We know that af after washing the feet of the disciples, he decided to set an example. It was important to replicate what he did. And this is crucial. We shall follow these steps of Jesus. We shall change the way in which we look around us. We can't look from the top to the bottom. This is not the right way in which we should be leaders. We should look also on the other way around from different perspectives. We should listen to different voices that maybe we couldn't hear before. This helps us to hear different calls of the spirit. We know that these processes of synodality ask for new structures and for a new importance to formation. The process of synodality is helping us in religious life to revise our structure and our ways to journey together in step with the times. And it is an invitation to journey together in the framework of our dear church. We believe that this experience is a grace. Thank you very much. Thank you. Just gracias. Thank you. To soak in the wisdom given to us. Sister Maria. Religious service and education. She entered the Apostolic Carmel Order in 1986 and took her first vows in 1990 and final vows in 1996. Her professional journey led her to significant positions including vice principal and school principal at Carmel Convent in Delhi. She's been actively involved in educational and religious organizations, such as CRI, which is an educational cell and education commission in the Delhi Archdiocese. She served as the regional secretary of the education commission in North India, and as provincial superior of her congregation's Western province in India. She has received numerous awards for her contributions, including the World Human Rights Award, the Best Principal Award, and the World Disaster Education Award. She was elected general superior of her congregation in February 2020, and in November of 2021, was elected president of the Conference of Religious of India, the CRI. Sister Nermalini, we await your wisdom. Thank you. 
Thank you. Thank you very much. I'm happy to share a few thoughts with all of you on my experience of this very word participation in the synodal journey. Participation is at the heart or rather the heartbeat of communion and mission. It brings together around the table every member who participates brings in their uniqueness, their originality, their giftedness, their blessedness. They each also bring together at the table their vulnerabilities. And for me, this has been a great personal journey as a leader of the congregation, as well as the president of the National Conference of Men and Women in India. As you know, India is a vast country, but though diverse in nature, but rich in culture. It was a graced moment to walk this journey, and I'm glad that this synod paved the way for a journey of togetherness. My experience of congregations, that congregations can no longer work in silos but we all need to work together. In the present context of India, which is going through quite a bit of turmoil, like some parts of the world are at this moment, it invites us religious who really are the bloodstream of the church as well as of the country, because religious men and women, particularly religious women, work through every nook and corner of our country. I'm also sh happy to share that within the congregation, the synodal journey challenged the leadership at every level, the congregational leadership, the province leadership, which was so hierarchical in nature. And that's the question I would like to put before all, all, all of us today that we perhaps need to look at the structures and the systems within before we even move outside. It was an interesting experience for me to listen to the voices at the initial and ongoing formation. Currently, before arriving here, I had a good talk with sisters preparing for their final vows and how they see religious life today. It was the first time that we opened this space for this sacred talk. And it helps us leaders to really take that in our prayer. I also feel that this participation brought in a whole lot of people, the lost, the least, and the marginalized of society, including the lay faithful and the people of God in churches. We understood, and, and for the first time, the people of God felt that they were listened to. At the recent uh, national conference of my executive team of men and women, we changed this pattern of just having some speaker and you know, you just listen and you go back home. But the whole process was now a synodal process and the experience that each one felt that there were no questions, no judgment passed, but it was a moment of how did we feel at the heart level. The journey from the head to the heart is quite a long and a challenging journey. So this was a beautiful invitation for us to move from the head to the heart, where we not only listen, and as Sister Pat already mentioned, we listen to the larger question, what is the invitation that God has for each one of us today in this synodal path? The wind blows, we do not know where it comes from, and we do not know where it will take us. But certainly, I'm very hopeful, enthusiastic, 
because it's brought in new energy for religious life who are already there in the forefront. But it looks as if we've been injected with new kind of spirit, new dimension to looking at life, our ministries, and our working together. Thank you very much. And I do pray for all of us as we carry all of you in our hearts during this journey. But let us continue reflecting what is the invitation of God in my personal life, in my community life that invites me or confronts me to look at the structures and systems within and outside. Thank you. Thank you, Sister Nirmalini. We've had four now, and we're going to take a longer pause so that you can even jot something down or just listen to the four in your mind and in your heart. And while you do that, we will move chairs. Our fifth speaker. We are very blessed. Brother Mark not only came once two weeks ago, but he came again. So this is part of his commitment to being brother and sister in Christ together. So welcome again, Brother Mark. He currently serves his community, the Brothers of the Sacred Heart, as Superior General. His community has an apostolate focused on the, on the formation of the young, and they serve in 31 countries worldwide. He has served as a teacher of science and religious studies, campus minister and principal in schools in Australia and the United States. And for the past 10 years, he has served his community in various leadership roles. So our brother Mark, welcome again. Thank you, Maria. I chose one of the questions because I think it, it lies at the heart of brotherhood. Um, the notion of servant leadership or the service of authority has numerous theories and structures, but it really lies at the heart of brotherhood, at the heart of our lived mission as religious. It is not enough to quote a rule, but it must be lived in the ordinary circumstances of life. As one of our earliest superiors general said, we must be a living rule. Others will know who we follow by who we are. Many years ago, I was new to leadership and elected provincial. And one of the elderly brothers in my community pulled me aside and said, well, I think we need to talk. And so he sat me down and promptly needed to tell me what he thought a provincial should do. But the key thing he said was, the title provincial, the brothers will give you trust to start with. But from then on, you must learn, you must earn it. And you do that by listening to everyone in every place, no matter who they are, what they do, in every school, in every ministry, attend to everyone. It was not simply do a job, but it was to talk, to sit, to listen, to pay attention, to value the other. And in that we could celebrate the reality of our life together. Yes, it's about kenosis, not importance. It's about being with those we serve, not in authority over them. It is about listening and being present. It is about relationship. Although the brother who spoke with me would not use the word emotional intelligence, that's what he was teaching me about that we could touch hearts, be present, listen, value the other, 
And even if we didn't remember a name sometime later, the time and presence mattered. And whatever difficult decisions may follow, it would never change the reality of these encounters. In an audience many years ago, Pope Benedict made a comment about the Christian life, which I think has something for us. We are only Christians if we encounter Christ, touch Christ's heart, and feel that Christ touches ours. And it is only in this personal relationship with Christ in this meeting with the risen one that we are truly Christian. And as we follow Jesus, we learn that our life is one of relationship, even to the touching of hearts, ours and others. And in that relationship with Jesus through the scriptures, it is what flows over into all the aspects of our lives. As our rule of life notes, Jesus pours out his love that must flow through us to others. So any renewal of the service authority is a call to walk with others, to touch hearts, to seek a common way forward. Structures may enable us to avoid the pitfalls that experience has shown us, but we can never avoid the reality that the call to the service of authority is always a call into relationship with the person of Jesus and with his people. Thank you. Thank you, and we take a moment to sit with this. Our next panelist is from Burundi. Sister Izeremana Elise comes from a Christian family actively involved in the local Catholic Church. That's how she begins her self-introduction. After completing her education, she joined the congregation of the Sisters of the Holy Family of Nazareth and made her religious profession in 2002. She has served in various roles within her congregation and the church, including pa parish pastoral work, catechesis, vocational formation and animation, both in Burundi and Italy. She has received training in religious sciences from the Pontifical Lateran University, formation for trainers from the Institute of Trainers affiliated with the Gregor Gregorianum, and ongoing formation for trainers at the Salesian Pontifical University. Since 2015, she has been a member of the Delegation Council of her sisters in the Great Lakes region. And since 2020, she has been part of the General Council of her congregation. Sister Izeramana brings valuable intercultural experiences from her congregation and the General Council given the presence of so many different cultures within the communities and the council itself. Bienvenue. Merci. Et partant de mon expérience à l'image qui m'a à l'esprit, et la construction d'une maison où plusieurs membres sont impliqués et appelés à participer activement, et chacun avec son charisme et ses différences. Au lieu de se présenter et d'exécuter des projets et des programmes déjà confectionnés, 
sans consultation aucune. Et la construction, la, la structure de l'Église et communion voulue par le Concile Vatican II doit s'affirmer aujourd'hui de l'Église et pyramidale et à l'Église et famille, où chaque membre a une richesse à donner et où le devoir de l'autorité est d'encourager et de faciliter la participation, de libérer la liberté de construire ensemble. J'encourage les églises et locales like to encourage local churches and the pastoral care to develop planning and discernment for a more incarnate evangelization, stressing the importance and the need for inclusive process for enlarged discernment. And the example is the example of women. They are um, the greatest participants of the uh, church in Africa and they are pillars in our local uh, churches, uh, but uh, they are minorities uh, when it comes uh, to making decisions. Uh, consecrated uh, women live their mission uh, amongst uh, the people of God uh, and uh, they are confronted with um, issues. Uh, and they know expectations more than priests. Instead of working in parallel, uh, cooperating with them would improve pastoral care and would develop together projects in order to better serve the church. This um, consecrated life should um, avoid authoritarianism and exclusion that is found here and there in communities. And this uh, inclusive uh, uh, process uh, should not be stopped, uh, but um, members uh, should be able to participate uh, responsibly um, uh, for uh, the betterment of the church and of congregations. Uh, and uh, um, um, different cultures um, uh, should be encouraged uh, to participate. Uh, and we need to be aware that the uh, spirit is blowing and uh, uh, discernment uh, uh, practices uh, um, um, ask the authorities uh, to be able to involve the whole of the Christian community um, for them to participate uh, in discernment. Uh, so we have to overcome the temptation of wanting to do um, alone, to jump to results immediately, um, because this is not enriching for the church and for our communities. So there are churches uh, where uh, Christians feel they are marginalized uh, because they are not um, consulted. Uh, but uh, uh, people are indifferent, and uh, also Christians uh, who are indifferent uh, do not want to participate because uh, they are not duly formed uh, on appropriate participation within the church. So we would like to stress the need for uh, formation for training um, uh, of the authorities uh, should uh, try and form lay members, uh, um, religious uh, members of the church, but also seminarians uh, to pastoral theology, ecclesial theology, for them to become aware of their duties and their rights uh, to enlarge the space of their freedoms uh, for their active uh, participation, but also there's the need to include in um, uh, formation houses um, um, courses uh, on uh, community discernment and the cooperation with other ministries uh, in order to destroy every tendency to clericalism and authoritarianism that uh, has, um, uh, uh, has been very present uh, in our communities. Uh, thank you very much for your kind attention. And a moment of silence to let the wisdom resonate. Our seventh panelist, Father Tesfe Tedese, was born in Harar, Ethiopia. He made his perpetual vows in the Institute of the Kamboni Missionaries in 1994 and was ordained a priest in Addis Ababa in 1995. He did his theological studies in Rome and worked for some years in Egypt and Sudan. He obtained his license 
at the Pontifical Institute for Arabic and Islamic Studies in Rome in 2001. He then returned to his native country to work in pastoral service. And after a short course on formation at the Silesianum in Rome, he worked in vocation promotion and formation from 2003 to 2004. In 2005, he was elected provincial superior of the Kamboni missionaries in Ethiopia, a position he held until 2009, and during which he was also president of the Conference of the Major Religious Superiors of Ethiopia. In the 17th General Chapter of 2009, he was elected general counselor. At the following general chapter in 2015, he was elected superior general. And in 2022, was reelected as superior general. Father Tesfai, you are most welcome. Grazie. Well, thank you very much. I was asked to speak in Italian. Well, so four points as for our sharing. The first one relates to the word faith. I believe that the experience of consecrated life has much to offer to the church. Already in the past, Pope Benedict XVI stated that every time in a monastery we need to tackle some important issue, let the abbot call the whole community and describe the issue at hand. But we said we need to consult the whole of the community because often words God reveals the best solution to the youngest members. This is something that we heard some time ago. And I believe that since that time, consecrated and religious life has offered much to the church. And this is what we live in. This is the first point. We as USG and UISG believe that we have a lot to offer to the church because we are sons and daughters of this church and we receive and therefore can give something. Second point, in our praxis of ordinary life in our communities, we live synodality, but how do we live it? In our rules, we read that at least once a month, we need to have the community council meeting. I don't know what is the situation in your congregations, but I'm pretty sure that the Kombani missionaries do not do that very often. This is the place of local discernment. The preparation for our general chapters and for our provincial assemblies is normally linked to the participation of our brothers by means of service, group working, regional meetings. We even leave for them some time for personal contribution. I think that this is a nice experience of discernment. There is still much to be improved. There is still much to be reviewed. However, we do have a structure for synodality. When I make a visitation, I say, well, where is the diary, the agenda of the council meetings? and some do not have it. Community discernment is not taken account of. Now, synodality at Intra needs to start working. And as for my experience, both 
in the conference of major superiors in Ethiopia, but also in the executive of UISG. As for my experience in CEDOS and in many other places, I can understand that synodality is something that we need to put into practice with other institutions. This is something that has been already told. Men and women, brothers and sisters, lay and religious people all together because there is a complementarity of charisms that we need to develop. What is our experience with the bishop conferences? As far as I am concerned, I can say that during my term as coordinator of major superiors in Ethiopia, the bishop conference usually invited me to attend their meeting. And when we had a sister being president, because we shift every three years, she was a bit afraid to participate, but also bishops were afraid to have her in the meeting. This means that we need to work, to still work on this topic. Most of uh, the congregations here are female congregations, and so we need to pray and wish for greater participation and more mutual trust. Third point, synodality, not just for ourselves, but for our wounded world. We lived the experience of the year for consecrated life, passion for God, passion for humanity. And this should be the very place in which synodality can be experienced in order to announce, to suggest solutions, to mutually being strengthened, to put together our strengths. This is the way to carry out synodality, but we still need to improve. When we put money together, there's still lot of synodality. What does it mean? We reflect together, we plan together, we use our resources together. Who has money in our communities decide? It is not the superior who decides, but it is the treasurer. I don't know if this is the case in your congregations, but what I mean is that putting together our resources was a nice experience of synodality. My last point relates to formation. We know by our personal experience that in order to grow, we need ourselves let be trained by our communities, by the church, by the world, by the problems and hurdles of the world. We can't train people to work for their self-promotion, for their career. We want to train people who work with others, with men and women, with European and African people, with Asian, with Latin American people, with Canadian people, with Australian people. Interculturality is our aim. Working with those who are rich and with those who are poor is equally important. We need to work with lay people and with bishops. This requires us a very committed formation. Our culture brings us towards individualism to just focus on ourselves, on our group. Instead, synodality calls us to open up our hearts and this requires us formation. Thank you very much. And a moment of silence. Sister 
Sister Elizabeth Davis, a Canadian, is a member of the Congregation of the Sisters of Mercy of Newfoundland and Labrador. Her extensive ministry experience spans years in areas of education, healthcare administration, public policy, scripture studies, which is her love, her great love, facilitation, governance, and religious life. She spent years as a high school teacher and has also held leadership positions in Catholic hospitals and regional health areas. She has made significant contributions to public policy through her involvement in commissions and studies. She holds a doctorate in theology with a focus on biblical studies from the University of Toronto. She has received many national and provincial honors, including the Order of Canada and the Order of Labrador, Newfoundland and Labrador. She's a pro prolific presenter on various topics, including healthcare transformation, leadership in changing times, scripture, religious life, and women in leadership. And so we welcome you, Sister Elizabeth. Thank you very much, Maria. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Jesus' words describe participation in communion and mission lived by communities of consecrated and religious life. From our beginning in the fourth century, we have lived on the peripheries, called to be boundary walkers by the way in which we live, where we live, and with whom we walk. We gather others in community to share our vision in schools and hospitals and orphanages, in shelters for abused or homeless persons, in places of refuge in ecological centers. We seek to reshape policy in our church and in governments. We listen deeply, contemplatively, and humbly to hear the voices that are far too often not heard, either in church or in society. Voices not heard because of fear or speaking languages that we do not understand. Voices of people, of beings other than human, and of earth. How is this live today by almost 750,000 women and men religious globally. By many of us who have been sharing since 2021 in the synodal journey, and then by a very few of us who are voting participants in the synod assembly. When we are our best selves, we are spirit walkers I'm sorry, boundary walkers in the spirit of our founders, but in a new reality of time and place. We respond to the cries of people who are poor, ill, alone, abused, uneducated, prisoner, homeless. We listen in humility to new voices, persons who no longer have a country, persons excluded because of their sexual orientation or their gender identity, persons with cognitive impairment or dementia, and earth and earth beings who are being exploited and abused. When we are our best selves, we are boundary walkers in how we listen, in what the Synod calls conversations in the spirit. And we are boundary walkers in our new ways of ministry, partners with indigenous peoples in healing and reconciliation, places of safety for homeless persons, abused women and children, refugees and asylum seekers, and persons who are facing the horrors of human trafficking an intentional focus not just on health care, but on health and well-being, engagement in ecological justice, 
ministry shared beyond ourselves, including the transfer of some of our communal ministries to other laypersons in leadership. Use of our money to influence the power of multinational corporations. Our presence where policy is being shaped in governments, on boards of universities and health systems, and in synods. What wisdom do we in consecrated life bring to this synod and to its approach to participation? I believe that we bring the daring wisdom of living, inclusion, and diversity, listening contemplatively to voices not easily or comfortably heard, to walking with the most unusual companions, and always to be walking boundaries. May we play our part in making certain that our church, impelled by the energy of the Spirit, lives in new ways every day the words of Jesus. I was a stranger, and you welcomed me. Thank you. And a moment of silence. It's with great gratitude that we've heard the wisdom from our brothers and sisters, and we will have at the end an opportunity to offer a blessing. But before that, so many spoke about the importance of listening to the stranger, that we, the friend we do not yet know that may be a stranger at the moment, but the importance in the synod of listening, of listening in our congregations. And what we offer during this series is also an opportunity to have an experience, short, but an experience of what will be in our synod and also what we hope will be continued practice in our church and congregations. And so I would ask the slide to come back. Thank you. And as you imagine what's resonating uh, for you before you go into the small groups, I, what did you hear that draws you that you would offer to your small group? And the second question is what resonates with your experience or what new lens is offered from what you have heard? Let me try to put this in a few of the languages. What did you hear that draws you, attracts you? And what new lens maybe is offered? The experience, again, will be that of conversation in the spirit. And it's a way of being together that allows for both deep listening and responsiveness. Synodality is about, to, is about mutually receptive and responsive ways of listening and engaging. In the first round of sharing, and you will have 20 minutes, uh, almost till t uh, 45 after the hour. The first round is your own response, and we would ask you to li be limited to one minute. And please, a timekeeper would probably be helpful. In the second round, it's no longer what you are thinking, but it's what you heard in your circle. It's what you heard online in your small group. So what did you hear from one another? Sometimes that's the most difficult step. The third round is what, what are you hearing together? What is the we? What are you starting to hear that's coming together? 
And so that's how we will have the, the three rounds. And then we'll come back to the large group and I will invite something different. Uh, if you were in the first two sessions, uh, this will be a, a different coming back. So this conversation is for your small group. So we will have you in your small groups according to languages until uh, Rome time, 345, whatever that time is, wherever you are. So I invite our tech people to, to move us into the groups. Thank you. And those of you who are here, we do have language tables also. So you may move around a little bit as well. Um. Sister, we ask you to, to tell us which language do you the other uh, presenters did to just Practice this in your communities. Practice this in a small group in your in your ministry, in, in your families. Uh, and just to see what happens, maybe it begins with the Sunday scripture passage. Uh, what drew you and what did you hear from one another? And what do you sense the Spirit is trying to say to us? One of the um, real guidelines and expectations of the small groups, uh, and this will be something that will be very seriously adhered to at the Synod, is that what happens, the conversation, uh, is confidential. These are, as others have spoken, sacred conversations. They need to be places at the Synod and in our communities and in our ministries where people can share honestly where I am today, what I'm sensing out of my own integrity, not out of I want to be right, I want to be wrong, but I, what I'm really sensing. And the whole uh, premise underneath it is that we do this openly and with, the, with really the openness to the spirit that can change our minds and our hearts. So the synod is call, a call to conversion and to a transformation according to the spirit. And so it really takes a lot of effort. And so to name it as a sacred conversation and to hold confidentiality so anything that said can be held in there and that we can learn from one another is key as it is a mutually receptive and responsive way of listening. So we thank you for that. Um, and we can move out of the uh, slides now because what we'd invite you to do, those of you who are online, is to take a moment and everyone is welcome, whatever language you choose, and to, in the chat, write your prayer for the delegates. Write a brief sentence, a word, a hope for them. We're just gonna take a few minutes of just silence and invite that prayer for you. We will not read them because I imagine there will be hundreds of prayers. But what we will do is to gather them from the chat and we will send them to the delegates so that they will have this also, your prayer. So take a few moments and please offer your prayer in the chat. And then we have one more moment that's significant and it will be a, a very special blessing. And for those of you in here, I think our tech people will try to show the chat as it's evolving.
we will leave we the will chat on for a few extra minutes after we conclude so you can continue writing your prayers. Sister Elizabeth next to me just murmured, it's the world, it's the world. And that is, that is what we are from and to and part of the church in the world uh, engaging. And we have just uh, a, a, another blessing. And I want to say to all of the sisters here who are in any way participating in the Synod, this prayer is also for you. These prayers are for you, for all of you that will be here at the Synod. Um, we hold one another in prayer. I, one more mode of prayer, and I'd like to invite Sister Mary John. Uh, an SSPS sister who's the Associate Executive Director of UISG to call forth another blessing. Thank you, Sister Maria. Dear brothers and sisters, we are coming to the close of this afternoon's program with a, a very important moment, that of sending the senior delegates off with a blessing. So for this, I invite all the OISG, OSG Synodal Delegates to the front. You can come and stand or you may sit. I will be moving also. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> so, dear delegates, we want you to hear the Thaise Atsumus Sancte Spiritus, which we heard at the beginning, because when you will hear it again during the period of the Synod, you will remember that we are with you and we are supporting you with our prayers. So both unions, the OSG and OISG, and all of you who are present here, and all those who are online, I invite all of you to raise your hand in a blessing as we hear, listen to this Taizé hymn.
Amén. Gracias. Amén. Thank you. Gracias. That was moving to see hundreds of arms raised in prayer and in gratitude to the Spirit. And we pray this for all those who will be gathered. We do want to remind the people here uh, who will be at the Synod, this, uh, when you hear this during the Synod, may we remember who's holding us among many other communities. So thank you so much for this. I wanna thank all of our delegates who made time out of a very busy schedule to join us. There are many things that you're in the midst of. So I thank you. And I thank you one and all who joined us uh, for the three sessions or any one session. We will shortly have all three sessions available for you, uh, the recording, so you can easily, and, and we invite you, share it widely. Uh, there's so much wisdom that's in the midst of this, but also use the conversation in the spirit as a way. Uh, that would be a way of also being in sync, as Sister Mary said, during the Senate. And so we invite that. Uh, thank you to our wonderful communication technology teams, interpreters, who did so much to move thank all you. of this. As someone new to UISG, I'm so aware of all the moving pieces and that they all work together is an act of the spirit as well as much skill yeah. also. And so we thank you. Uh, please also watch. Um, there will be a post-synod um, gathering that we will uh, announce so that you can hear from the delegates also um, what came forth. But there will be news throughout the month. Uh, and so we invite you to the Taize prayer tomorrow evening, now that you have the song in your, yeah. in your ears ringing but also the opening session, uh, the opening liturgy uh, with Pope Francis and, and many, uh, all are welcome to it. And the different places where there'll be uh, input from the Senate office and communication. And uh, please, most of all, your prayers. Uh, the wind keeps blowing, closing, uh, opening windows and closing them. So we know the spirit is in the midst of this too. Uh, that's not a doubt at all. And those of you gathered here, we have a little bit of refreshment. And those of you online, have a wonderful Friday morning, afternoon, evening. Hallelujah. Grazie, merci beaucoup. Um, please have a wonderful, wonderful weekend. Thank you.